Well, thank you so much. Uh, good morning. It's an honor uh, to be here in the uh, centennial of uh, Carl Henry's birth to, to honor his legacy. And so I'm delighted, uh, so grateful for the Henry Center, for everything they do in the name of, uh, of Carl Henry. Thank you to, to Tom and to, to Jeff uh, for what you have done to, uh, to, to pull this together. I'm grateful. And so I think as you know, I'm the leadoff hitter today, I think at the outset, um, at least my understanding, um, is that part of the design of this conference is that we're attempting, in Greg Thornberry's words, to make Henry cool again. And so I'm, I'm painfully aware, though, that, that I'm probably not the right person to do that. So you'll have a great lineup of speakers throughout the day to do that, um, who are much, uh, much better dressed and uh, much more articulate, perhaps, than me. But I, I think what Thornberry means by that is that we want to recover uh, the work of Dr. Henry and cherish the work of this towering figure of a generation past and, and basically recommend his insights uh, for a new day. Um, and so uh, that's, that's, that's the aim of this this morning. And this morning I want to talk about uh, the, uh, the relationship between uh, Dr. Henry's thought as theological method and a contemporary movement, the theological interpretation of Scripture. So, of course, Carl Henry preceded uh, the current renaissance of the TIS movement by a generation. And I don't mean, I want to be clear on this, I don't mean in any way uh, to suggest that either that Dr. Henry was a harbinger of the present movement or even that there are necessarily direct lines of influence that exist between the two. But I do think that his hermeneutical instincts ran along the same basic tracks. And so I think it's profitable to bring Henry into dialogue with the current discussion. What Henry offers, I will argue, is a model for sane, Christ-centered hermeneutics that has the potential to mentor a new generation of exegetes and theologians. And so those who are broadly familiar with Henry's corpus might wonder what material exists even to support such a claim. Indeed, Carl Henry's exegesis of Scripture won't be confused with that of his frequent sparring partner, Karl Barth, who small print sections of the Church Dogmatics offer a veritable gold mine of exegetical insights. Even Greg Thornberry acknowledges in his recent book that though Karl cited a lot of Bible verses in his work, I'm quoting here, context for those references, Thornberry says, was often not always provided. He suggests, Thornberry does that is, that perhaps Henry's relatively weak command of Hebrew may have limited his exegesis. So while I grant some of these observations, I think it should come to, as no surprise to, to any of us, especially those of you here who, who knew Dr. Henry, that the man who deeply loved, the man who defended um, articulately the, the authority of Scripture, drank deeply from it, um, is one who uh, engaged the Scriptures deeply. And so his voluminous writings provide ample grist, I believe, to discern his working biblical hermeneutic. And in this paper, we'll survey some of the most promising of these sources. And so these sources that we're going to look at fall into three basic types. First, his sermons and his biblical commentary on the Gospel of John, and then his theological writings. We're going to proceed inductively first. We're going to examine Henry's uh, sermons and his biblical commentary. That's a biblical commentary on the Gospel of John again. And in, we're going to attempt to characterize his implied hermeneutic. And once this is achieved, we will then take more of a deductive tact um, reasoning from the patterns that emerge in Henry's theological writing to a comparison with contemporary uh, hermeneutical currents. So first, the sermons of Carl F.H. Henry. Henry maintained an active preaching ministry throughout his life, and his sermons were regularly featured in various collections of best sermons or sermons for special occasions. In addition to, the me in addition to these messages pre um, preserved in volumes like those, uh, the Henry Archive here at Trinity's uh, Rolfing Library contains messages even from her Henry's earliest years uh, when he was uh, pastoring and expositing here uh, in the areas when he was uh, working as a student at, uh, at Northern Seminary. Even a, even a cursory glance at those sermons uh, and his early preaching ministry reveals what I think is a, a very clear Christ-centered approach. Henry consistently not only sought to expound the text before him, but to interpret that text in light of the gospel and provide the savor of Christ, of which Charles Spurgeon so famously speaks. 
And so I think it's best to simply let Henry's exposition speak for itself. So what follows, we're going to review just some examples, some illustrative exa examples of, of Henry's work. So uh, dividing his sermons into sort of two broad headings, certainly there are more. But, but first, uh, sermons relating to Henry's cultural engagement and, uh, and, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Henry's legacy of cultural engagement, beginning with the un uneasy conscience of modern fundamentalism, fundamentalism is well known. This activism was a recurring theme throughout his life. It surfaced in editorials at Christianity Today, um, in articles, in globe-trotting lectures, and not surprisingly, his uh, sermons as well. Always substantive, uh, Henry's messages aren't uh, Jeremiad's uh, offering moralistic solutions. Instead, Henry exposited the text in the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The prologue of John's gospel is foundational for Henry's hermeneutic. On the basis of John 1, 3, all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Henry insisted the space-time universe is no blind, unthinking process, empty of ultimate meaning. Things are not the ultimate reality, Henry says, but have been fashioned by the Logos, their creator. Building on this thought, he adds, the Logos is more than the agent of man's creation. He is the light of man's life. Consequently, Henry affirms the Christian evangel must exhibit Jesus Christ afresh as the only true and changeless center of abundant life and enduring culture. These convictions drive Henry's reading of Scripture and surface repeatedly as themes in his sermons. Henry's lament was that the American culture in the West more broadly had rejected the majestic truth that the center and climax of history belonged to Jesus Christ, the eternal Logos incarnate. He notes with sadness that we live in a world almost fatally divided against itself, a world hopelessly disunited from God and tragically unaware that Jesus Christ is the lost center of human life and existence. This outlook characterizes Henry's exposition. As he unfolds Romans 13, 11 to 14, he provides a cultural analysis that honestly could have been written last week. He cites the increasing acceptance of homosexuality. He references the abortion epidemic. The illegal drug problem is representative of some of societal ills. But the solution he prescribes in the face of increasing bleakness isn't moralistic. He doesn't wax nostalgically about perceived greater or brighter days of yore. Instead, citing Ephesians 2, 2 and 3, he implores, Don't for a moment forget that we ourselves were dug from the sludge of a sick society. The risen Christ, the one who rescues even those who become theologians and pastors and deacons, is in the moving and lifting business. And he removes repentant sinners from their old lives into divine service. He urges, we need to do more than to sponsor a Christian subculture. We must strive to reclaim this cosmos for its rightful owner, God, who has title to, a cattle, to the cattle on a thousand hills, and for Christ, who says to the lost multitudes, I made you, I died for you, I ransomed you. Such gospel centrality pervades Henry's sermons, and he affirms that the gospel itself is the central plot line of Scripture. Henry summarizes, the book of Genesis sets God's offer of redemption in the context of man's creation and his fall. The gospel of John shows man's need of the new birth in view of the Logos, who is the creator, redeemer, and judge of life. And the Pauline letters, likewise, relate life and history at their commencement, center, and climax to the living God manifested in Jesus Christ. And so now looking at a second group of his sermons uh, focused on the being and the advance of the church. Henry's role as, a, as an evangelical statesman meant that he was frequently asked to speak on the state of the church in the United States. And so he became something of a go-to representative of conservative uh, Protestantism uh, on various subjects, particularly ecumenism. Henry seemed never to be given to a rosy outlook on the American church, and so Henry often sought to stir the church to deeper faithfulness and to vitality. One sermon, uh, The Risen Christ in His Radiant Church, is exemplary in this respect. Suggested by the publisher uh, of the organizer of this, uh, this special days for, uh, sermons for evangelicals, that this sermon would be a appropriate for the Sunday after Easter, Henry exposits Mark 16, 19 to 20 in a Christ-centered fashion. Henry does acknowledge the disputed nature of the long ending of Mark, but he determines, nevertheless, the last two verses are serviceable, especially for sermonic purposes. I can appreciate that as a full-time pastor. Serviceable. 
Um, as Henry introduces the text, he laments the lack of holy radiance in the church, and he bemoans the multitudes of church members who now lack heart for courageous witness. Henry diagnoses the root of the problem, and his proposed solution uh, reveal much. He evokes the church's vision of the resurrected Christ as constitutive of its character. He says, and I'm quoting here, the early church knew it was called into being by a resurrection voice. When silenced by crucifixion, the commanding voice had come back from the dead. I am he that liveth and was dead. While stunned by his crucifixion, the disciples were stabbed awake, shocked alive by his resurrection. So then, after the risen Lord Jesus had spoken to them, this is the real sense of our text, Henry says. They heard and recognized his voice. They not only recalled his earthly teachings, his sinful life, his miracles, magnificent as all these were, they likewise knew him as crucified and risen. So the real sense of Mark 16, 19, Henry urges, is its impetus for the Christian mission in the world in the resurrected Christ. For the disciples, both individually and corporately, this truth set the tone for their whole life and mission. The risen and ascended Christ was their glorified head, and they knew that he alone was calling his church into being. The early church, Henry says, knew Christ on the throne, not merely the Christ of the Bethlehem manger. He continues, the early church knew the crown Christ. It knew that the Lord Jesus is alive, that he alone is Lord, that he is the ruler of heaven and earth, and that neither earthly rulers nor demonic forces, neither Satan nor blind fate can be in ultimate control of things here below. The church's charter, in other words, is of heavenly origin, and through its head the church already has existence in the eternal order. The head of the body has already passed through his death and resurrection, and in him believers are seated in the heavenlies. Moreover, from that eternal order, by way of earnest or sample, the head of the church now imparts to believers powers and virtues that belong to the world to come. And so what I think is particular, uh, of particular interest for our purposes this morning, at least the, the purpose of my thesis, is that Henry interprets Mark 16, 19 to 20 with respect to the commissioner rather than the commission, the broader great commission there in Mark 16 uh, itself. The session of the resurrected and ascended Christ is the very basis and power for the Christian mission in the world. The church will radiate Christ's glory only insofar as she sets her sights on the Christ who has been crowned and seated at the Father's right hand. And so what, what emerges from these sermons is not just what I, is a, is a very latent but a very robust ecclesiology, a doctrine that it bears noting Henry has been uh, accused, maligned even, of uh, neglecting. But I think also what we see here in his approach is a, is a Christ-centered approach to biblical interpretation. In each of the messages we've surveyed, and there, there are more that will eventually make it, I understand, into a, a journal article, um, Henry pursues Christ crucified in these messages. Christ crucified, Christ risen as the ultimate telos of the biblical text. He makes application that is consistent with this end. And though these messages represent only a slice of his expository output, the consistency in his approach, I think, suggests the centrality of Christ um, is a crucial tenet for Henry's hermeneutic. Now I want to move and talk about uh, Henry's uh, commentary on the Gospel of John. Though Henry is not often remembered uh, for his biblical interpretation, uh, Henry did serve as the consulting editor for a significant Bible commentary uh, in the mid-20th century entitled The Biblical Expositor. This three-volume, whole Bible commentary gathered an ensemble cast of mid-20th century evangelical contributors, including the likes of Gleason Archer, F.F. F. Bruce, uh, Philip Etchum Hughes, uh, Kenneth Kitchen, uh, George Eldon Ladd, Leon Morris, among others. And notably, I think, um, Henry, as the editor, didn't restrict the group of contributors uh, merely to strictly trained biblical exegetes. Uh, he included uh, noted theologians among uh, the commentators, such as J.I. Packer, Jeffrey Bromley, Gordon Clark, John Gerstner, and of course himself. Um, while these three volumes have less ambitious aims than some of the current projects like the Brazos Theological Commentary or the forthcoming T.T. Clark International Theological Commentary, they do signal, I think, that for Henry, the task of interpreting Scripture is something that belongs to those who have been you know, strictly trained in a theological discipline as well. Henry, as many of you probably know, had a lifelong love with the Gospel of John. He quoted it uh, regularly. He alluded to it frequently. Uh, we've already noted how that Gospel, uh, and especially the prologue, impacted his hermeneutic. Um, 
And his prologue, I should also say, I think it shaped um, his doctrines of Christ, his doctrine of humanity, and even his doctrine of revelation. So the fourth gospel provided the text oftentimes for Henry's preaching. Just if you were to go in the archives, I, I, I read numerous times running across messages preached from the gospel of John. And so it's no surprise that as the editor for this commentary, uh, the biblical expositor, that Henry would select for himself the gospel of John as the book that he would provide commentary for. So I think it's interesting. Uh, this is significant for us, for our purpose, um, because it provides what I think is the most sustained uh, and focused glimpse into what Henry's biblical interpretation looks like. And so, again, want to sort of uh, break up uh, his, uh, his commentary as we try to think about it into two, two main areas. Uh, first, his theological themes that he would see um, as, he, as he walked through the Gospel of John, and then we're going to see uh, something of his reading and interpretation of the Old Testament. So, as the reader, first theological themes though. So, as the reader works through the commentary, um, Henry's theologically interested reading emerges very quickly. He spares no opportunity uh, to connect the biblical text to theological loci. On the whole, the connections that Henry draws are natural and are well suited, I think, to his commentary on the text. And so, first, um, the Trinity and Christology. The Gospel of John lends itself, obviously, to Trinitarian and Christological connections, and Henry draws these out. Henry believes that even John's structure, its scope, its content, its arrangement, stress the great fact of Christ's deity, and he views its differences from the synoptics as, a, as strategic aims to, in, in, in essence, reinforce this truth. Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus and John, then, according to Henry, presents Nicodemus with the great fact of Christ's divine incarnation, of his absolute uniqueness. Um, he is the only begotten Son. Similarly, when Jesus feeds the 5,000, walks on the water, these are Christological signs which speak of an incarnate, ascended Redeemer who lifts to, the, to a spiritual destiny and eternity all who put their trust in Him. There are Trinitarian soundings as well. The, Lord, the Word becomes flesh, um, there in John 1.14, uh, Henry says, was in eternity past not simply an idea, but a person alive and at work in the divine society of the Godhead. In a discussion of John 5, 19 to 23, he alludes to the affirmation that the opera Trinitatis uh, ad extra sunt in divisa, the uh, external outward works of the Trinity are undivided. When he remarks, the Jewish leader's decision against Jesus is a decision against God himself, for the Son and the Father are not to be isolated in their work. Now looking at soteriology, Henry's focus on the gospel surface, sur on the, the gospel, the, the evangel, surfaces regularly in his commentary. Not only does Jesus' meeting with Nicodemus attest his deity, but in, it, it, it unveils the great pivot points of biblical theology, which include the indispensability of repentance, the necessity of the new birth, the possibility of the new birth through the incarnation, Christ's atonement for sin, justification as the only alternative to condemnation, and sanctification as the only alternative to human depravity. Moreover, when Jesus responds to Peter's dismay as he prepares to wash his feet, he emphasizes, according to Henry, the necessity of both once-for-all regeneration and the daily experience of sanctification. Now, lastly, looking at ecclesiology and eschatology. In perhaps Henry's most innovative interpretive mood, Henry, move, uh, Henry says that the large number of fish caught by the disciples at Jesus' direction in John 21 may suggest the cosmopolitan and universal nature of the church. He says the number 153 is assertedly the number of species of fish in the Sea of Galilee. So given this reading, it's perhaps not surprising, or it's perhaps surprising that Henry doesn't plumb um, another ecclesiological text, John 10:16. Uh, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, a reference I would suggest to the Gentiles. Uh, but Henry doesn't. Um, as concerns eschatology, um, he reads uh, the paralytic's healing at the pool of Bethsaida in, uh, in John 5 as anticipating the future resurrection of the dead at Christ's bidding. I think he's on solid footing here since at the same setting, Jesus himself refers to the hour coming when the dead will awake either to the resurrection of life or to judgment. He similarly, Henry does, similarly views the resurrection of Lazarus as a supremely a God's sign 
of God's kingdom among men. And so as this survey shows, none of the theological connections that Henry draws are particularly daring. And I actually think that's as it should be. Um, but without acknowledging the principle, I think what's operating here behind the scenes is that Henry's exegesis is actually guided um, by the rule of faith. The rule the, the, that the core truths of the faith recognized by the early church distilled in uh, early uh, creole statements like the Apostles' Creed, it seems to, for Henry both to guide and to inform his reading. While perhaps on a strictly grammatical historical reading of the Gospel of John, some of these theological concerns that Henry uh, draws out would have been bracketed out, um, Henry's prior theological commitments enable him to perceive the abundant theological themes in the fourth gospel and to then make these explicit. We should hasten to add, or I would hasten to add, that Henry is not reading theological loci into the Gospel of John. Instead, to, to use uh, David Yeago's insight on the logic of theological exegesis, very influential argument, uh, Henry expresses the same theological judgment that the text itself makes, but he expresses it in different conceptual language. And so now moving to Henry's reading of the Old Testament as evidenced by um, his commentary on the Gospel of John. His commentary on the fourth gospel also discloses his approach to interpreting the Old Testament. Henry's hermeneutic reflects a commitment to the unity of the biblical canon and specifically its redemptive historical unity. He affirms that, like the Old Testament, the fourth gospel presents the human race lost in sin, powerless to save itself, and God himself providing his promised salvation as an act of unmerited grace. Though directed toward John's gospel, um, I think this statement reveals much, if not more, about Henry's posture toward the Old Testament. In particular, Henry signals his understanding that the plot line of Scripture revolves around humanity's spectacular fall from its created perfection, its total inability to return to fellowship with its creator king, and its need to cast itself wholly on the undeserved favor of God. This affirmation of Scripture's unity manifests itself in other exegetical particulars of Henry's commentary on the Gospel of John, and so we'll look at a few of these. Um, and so identify first a pattern of promise to fulfillment. Henry evidences a, a recognizable commitment, I think, to a promise fulfillment understanding of the relationship between the Old and New Testaments. He notes that in John's Gospel, the disciples exhibit growing faith in Jesus as the Redeemer of the Old Testament promise. Likewise, John the Baptist identified Jesus as the grand climax of the Old Testament and the one in whom the great fulfillment is now at hand. Indeed, the Father's spoken revelation in Old Testament prophecy is one of the chief witnesses to Jesus' identity as the Messiah. Now looking at uh, from, such, from shadow to substance, uh, this approach is further developed as Henry regularly notes the inadequacy of the Old Testament provisions. Henry interprets the miracle at Cana as demonstrating the inadequacy of the water, parts, water pots uh, long associated with the Old Testament ritual of cleansing to meet the present need. He continues, in these same water pots, Jesus turns the water into wine, which elsewhere in Christian, Christian teaching symbolizes the blood of Christ. He goes on to highlight the inadequacy of the sacrificial system for the conquest and judgment of sin, which are achieved only in Christ. In fact, this is the purpose of the temple cleansing, which dramatically signifies that Jesus' very body is the place where God is propitiated. Without this atonement, all the temple sacrifices, Henry says, become empty, and with it they become superfluous. Lastly, in an interesting interpretive mood, hen move, Henry couples theological insight with a redemptive historical approach in, in interpreting John 7, 37 to 39. On the last day of the great day of the Feast of Tabernacles, Henry comments, In this promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit fulfilled at Pentecost, Jesus applies to himself the Mosaic account of the water from the rock, Deuteronomy 8.15, just as previously he had interpreted the manna concerning himself. Henry's remark here is interesting because the text itself in John 7 makes no explicit allusion to Deuteronomy 8.15, and yet Henry reads Jesus' saying as the application of this very account. Henry likely, I, th I think, is doing so with some assistance from 1 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4. All ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. 
I think that's in the background, but Henry doesn't acknowledge his dependence on 1 Corinthians at this point. While more could be said, I think, about the specifics of the exegetical point, um, just for our purposes here, I want to flag this and highlight the ease that Henry is able to move within the Testaments and with it the accompanying redemptive historical framework that I think lies beneath uh, such a move. And so just by way of summary, uh, Henry's engagement with the Old Testament reveals an implicit whole Bible hermeneutic that follows well-established paths in relating the Old Testament and the New. As we have seen, patterns of promise, fulfillment, shadow, and substance occur regularly in his commentary on the Gospel of John. And again, I think it's reasonable to presume that these characterize Henry's biblical hermeneutic more broadly. When his theologically attuned reading of Scripture is taken together with this approach, uh, affinities between uh, Henry's hermeneutic and the current TIS movement uh, begun, begin to come into focus, I think. And so now, lastly, I want to look um, at Henry's theological writings and God, revelation, and authority in particular. Thus far, we have reasoned inductively from various sources to uh, try to establish our thesis that Carl Henry's hermeneutic runs along the same basic tracks as the contemporary TIS movement. These tracks predate both the TIS movement and Carl Henry. Indeed, they are ancient paths trod by many faithful saints throughout the history of the church. Having reasoned this way in our paper to allow the reader, uh, the hearer, to gain an appreciation for Henry's approach on his own merits, now I want to shift to a more deductive pattern as we consider his implied hermeneutic on the basis of the patterns of reason that emerge from his more strictly theological writings. Before uh, pl plunging headlong into these, though, let's just quickly, for your benefit, uh, describe a, a thumbnail sketch of what the TIS, Theological Interpretation of Scripture movement is, so that our reading of Henry has some um, appropriate uh, background. So the Theological Interpretation of Scripture is a, a broad movement with a shared set of, uh, of hermeneutical dispositions. It emerges in the 1990s, um, and TIS is representing an effort to recover distinctly theological interpretation of Scripture. Um, it's led by figures such as Francis Watson, Stephen Fowl, Kevin Van Hooser, uh, Daniel Trier, and we could name uh, others, certainly. And the movement really gained momentum in the 2000s and is now in full flower. Uh, and as evidence for this, I would cite three biblical commentary series that have adopted this aim. Um, I mentioned uh, the Brazos, the TNT Clark, and also the Two Horizons uh, commentary series in the Old and New Testaments. Um, there's a substantive uh, dictionary that's outlining its approach to key interpretive issues, uh, edited by Dr. Kevin Van Hooser, and a respected theological journal, the Journal, journal of Theological Interpretation, uh, edited by Joel Green. Though the movement is diverse, I think key dispositions um, that can be agreed upon in the movement uh, are an appreciation for pre-critical interpretation, engagement with Christian doctrine in accordance with the rule of faith, reading scripture within the community of the Spirit, and appreciation for the unity of Scripture. And so having given that uh, little thumbnail sketch, now let's look at the relationship between TIS and Carl F.H. Henry. Obviously, it would be a, a rank uh, anachronism to, to label Carl Henry as part of this movement. And so for this reason, we have simply tried to argue that Henry's hermeneutic parallels uh, that movement, reflecting some similar concerns, uh, as many interpreters in the history of church uh, undoubtedly do as well. And so let's consider some of the similarities. First, uh, the commitment or the appreciation for pre-critical exegesis. Part of the impetus behind TIS is its rejection of the hegemony of historical critical exegesis. Historical criticism focused on the human features of the biblical text, preferring to explain causation on the basis of natural social factors rather than divine, which consequently led to a preoccupation with the historical references, times, and locales of the text's writing. Though Henry acknowledged valid uses of historical criticism, he rejected abuses of that method that effectively bracketed out the divine. The problem, Henry says, is not the method per se, but rather the alien presuppositions to which neo-Protestant scholars subject it. Combination of the method, he says, with an anti-supernaturalistic bias reflects not a requirement of the method, but a prejudice of the historian. 
So Henry does, in fact, de defend the, the use of method as an investigative tool in large part because he refuses to allow scriptural history to be relegated to some sort of ahistorical supra-history. Uh, if you're familiar with history, that's a, uh, with Henry, rather, that's a, it's a large concern for him. And so in some ways, uh, he is more appreciative uh, of historical critical method than uh, perhaps uh, you would think just on the surface. But um, he, he allows, however, that the inspiration and authority of Scripture uh, do not render such in historical investigation unimportant. Nonetheless, he does maintain the need for a special deference for the divine claims of the Bible. And so he, again, he's, he's, he's trying to go both ways. He's trying to value uh, the importance of the historical critical method, um, acknowledge that it has some utility, but at the same time he does want to acknowledge and, uh, and maintain um, that Scripture that we should have a special deference, as he says in his words, for the divine claims uh, made of the supernatural uh, author uh, of Scripture. And so I, I think we can say that Henry's appreciation for pre-critical exegesis is certainly underdeveloped in comparison to contemporary uh, TIS advocates, but the two are operating from similar premises. Next, I want to talk about the rule of faith. We previously noted how the rule of faith guided Henry's exegesis in the Gospel of John. And the pages of God, Revelation, and Authority yield further insight into the interplay between Scripture and doctrine for Henry. As Henry is setting forth his doctrine of the Trinity, a rich exchange occurs as Henry is defending the eternal sonship of Christ. Uh, this is happening in, uh, in Volume 5, there in his section on the doctrine of the Trinity. Key confessions and figures make appearances. Uh, there's Nicaea, there's the Athanasian Creed, there's Augustine, Gregory of Nyssa, Luther, Calvin. In these, Henry combines with Scripture to articulate the orthodox position um, on the eternal uh, begottenness of the Son. Though Henry does know exegesis here, he proceeds mainly by way of proof texts. This does not mean that exe ex exegetical judgments have not been made. The confluence of sources there in that section and in other sections um, suggests that Henry is not beholden to a, a very strict, uh, rigorous, uh, constrictive form of grammatical historical exegesis, though it does certainly serve as his default exegetical pattern. Um, but he's influenced by what the church has taught, and it, I believe what the church has taught and what other interpreters um, have seen in the text guides and influences his own reading um, of, um, of the scripture. And again, specifically in this section, uh, the history of interpretation of these texts leads Henry to a, down a certain path. I think there's an influence there that, uh, that, that he acknowledges and that he respects as he comes to uh, those texts. Next, um, and I've already alluded to this, but Henry has an appreciation of the unity of scripture this feature, uh, noted also uh, in, its connection, in connection with Henry's commentary on the fourth gospel, is central to theological interpretation. And so Henry affirms it as well. He says, The unity of the Bible is not to be found in its literary genres nor in its human writers. It is found in the message and meaning of the book, namely that the living sovereign God stands in the beginning of the universe, man and the worlds, as creator and governor. In other words, the unity of Scripture is a feature of divine inspiration in Scripture's redemptive message. That this is operative for Henry is evidenced in a variety of places, not least in his stirring development of the love of God and his treatment of the divine attributes. Um, that is found in, uh, in volume 6, and it's, a, it's really a beautiful, uh, s some parts of, of God's revelation and authority are, are tedious. Um, it's, honestly, this is one of the more beautiful sections as Henry uh, develops um, uh, the love of God as, a, as an attribute of, um, of our Lord. So beginning with Adam and Eve, him and Henry demonstrates the faithful covenantal love of God throughout the Old Testament, which finds its completion in the Messiah who is at once subject and object of God's love, the climactic demonstration of the Father's love. And so as he articulates that, as he brings it together, Henry exhibits a masterful sweep through Scripture. And this, I think, reveals, again, his deep commitment to the harmony um, of the Bible. Now I want to talk about the community of the Spirit. 
and specifically reading scripture within that community. In contrast to the, to the misguided caricature that Henry neglects the Holy Spirit, Henry does maintain a vital work for the Spirit in biblical interpretation. At least notionally, uh, I think for him, the sphere of this activity is the church, only where the Holy Spirit holds priority over the church, as he does in the third article of the Apostles' Creed, Henry says, will the church fully enjoy spirit-born fruits and gifts. Henry advances a thorough account, uh, this is volume four of GRA, advancing that, um, sorry, urging that uh, the Spirit empowers Christians to receive and appropriate the scriptures and promotes in them a normative theological comprehension for a transformed life. This occurs via the Spirit's enlivening to us individually of the objectively given special biblical revelation. That Henry prioritizes the work of the Spirit in connection with the theological interpretation of Scripture is very clear, and any suggestion to the contrary is really simply misinformed. But this doesn't mean that the in emphasis is identical to that of the TAS movement. While Henry locates the point of illumination at the individual level, the Spirit enlivens individuals, he says. Um, TAS pre prefers to recognize the Spirit's illumining work in the broader body of Christ in both local uh, and uh, global instantiations of the church and throughout all time and cultures. And so I think Henry's approach is compatible um, with that of TIS, but they do have different points of emphasis. And so now uh, we have arrived uh, at the end of the matter. What should we make of Henry's biblical hermeneutic? Just want to suggest uh, three points by way of closing. First, Henry's hermeneutic does, we have argued, events resemblances and common concerns with those in the current TIS movement. Though no direct line of influence from Henry to TIS exists, they share antecedents in the great interpretive tradition of the church, and they move along the same interpretive tracks. In spite of the paucity of uh, extended examples, Henry exhibits sound, theologically-minded interpretive habits. A theologian need not always show his work in order to receive credit as a careful biblical thinker. Henry deserves greater credit for his interpretive prowess, which manifests itself in consistent whole Bible, redemptive historical, Christ-centered readings. Second, Henry serves as a noteworthy evangelical example of sane theological exegesis. Theological commentary need not be flashy or innovative or contrived to be regarded as noteworthy. And in fact, if it's not, it might be regarded as more noteworthy. Henry represents the sort of theological engagement that is eminently useful. He genuinely illumines the biblical text by placing it within its wider canonical context, and thereby he's demonstrating the value of doctrine in the life of the church. Third and, and finally, Henry models faithful Christ-centered reading and exposition of the biblical text. The Christ-centered, gospel-centered movement in evangelicalism today um, is, it continues unabated. And certainly I think the evangelical church rightly uh, celebrates every occasion that these twin themes of gospel centricity, uh, uh, Christ, uh, Christocentricity, um, as we celebrate these things as matters of first importance. As a younger, zealous generation matures, however, um, I think they would do well to consider that their points of emphasis are not new, but actually they're ancient. Um, and they should, not, they should also not forget that uh, they're not the first generation of evangelicals to read Scripture along these tracks. Really, you only need to look back uh, so far as the previous generation to look at Carl Henry. Carl Henry was a faithful herald of the gospel of Jesus Christ who never tired uh, of focusing all attention on Christ and Christ in Him crucified. Henry's was a powerful voice crying out in the midst of the dark world, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. May we, all of us, as Henry's heirs, as Tom alluded to in one way or another, uh, may we go and do likewise as he did. Thank you.